Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much for attending um, today's uh, technical webinar on the topic of optimizing cooling loads and ventilation rates in office buildings. Uh, as you can see, we are still doing our workshops online as webinars due to the global health situation. So if you have not attended one of our webinars before, I will be going over a few practical points before I introduce today's facilitators. We aim to keep our webinar as interactive as possible. So throughout the webinar, you can submit your questions using the question box on your control panel. And we will be, uh, the Emirates GBC team will be monitoring your questions and we will try to answer uh, after, after Mr. Sagar finishes his um, lecture. After the webinar, we will also be share, sharing with everyone a recording of the presentation. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Sagar. Um, he is the Managing Director at Consistent Engineering Consultants. Uh, he is the Founder and the Managing Director of PBC, an MAP consultancy headquartered in Dubai with regional offices in Mumbai. He has over 12 years of experience and he has led more than 500 projects in the MENA region and India. Uh, Mr. Sagar, I will be handing over to you right now. Uh, Mr. M M Mr. Sagar, your your voice is not clear. Uh, is it okay now? No. It's. Uh, I can hear uh, a metallic sound along with your voice. Uh, uh, hi, is that okay now? Not really. Sorry for the technical glitches. Everything was tested. Hello. Yes, yes, I can hear you, but your voice is not clear at all. Uh. Is it okay if I stop the camera yes, and give the yes, speaker me a minute? It's fine. Mr. Sagar, you, okay. you sound good now. Okay, fair enough. Okay. okay, so as explained, I will pass over the controls to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. You can start the presentation. No, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Okay. First of all, uh, good morning, everyone. And sorry for little challenging times, even after all checkings, little glitches in technical aspects. Uh, nice to get in touch with you on a digital platform. This is all about human beings. Uh, in, in spite of any challenges, we find out the ways to move further. And EGBC has been doing the same thing. Uh, we have been a proud member of EGBC for the last three years. And today I'm taking an opportunity to discuss about what uh, standards for the air conditioning office building we have to apply, uh, how, the, how the designs are done, and uh, a typical case study in which the building design was completed, what ways we can uh, handle the Value engineering, or you can say, optimize the designing of the AC for the typical office building. 
In today's scenario, we all are talking about uh, energy audits and uh, sustainability. Now, everything starts right from a design concept or design phase. If the designs are properly done uh, with proper understanding, application of proper codes, then uh, the aspect of the sustainability gets implemented right from the design stage. We don't have to spend additional effort and money and time post construction of the building. So how do all aspects are encompassed in various standards? How can we apply is what we'll see. So and the topic we are talking about is the particular air conditioning system for the uh, uh, office buildings. Uh, we have got a, a project where the building was already designed by some good consultant. All that happens is consultant drives the design as per the client requirement. And clients, they would like to be on safer side. They should not, they, they would like to avoid any risk of having any issues related to air conditioning. So it's the approach is better safe than sorry. So the inputs from client come to a level that let's have air conditioning, which will not have any problems. At times, the client inputs also drives and goes into the zone of the design, where the, the things get complicated. We'll look at the complete aspects and we'll look at the case study, how the inputs from client has impacted the whole design and to what matter the uh, optimization in the design can be done. So this is what the whole topic about case study of office building. Then we'll talk about what are the components of the load, what is the distribution of the load, how the equipments are selected, that is chillers and cooling towers, the power comparison, and the benefits. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a typical case study of office building, which was designed and uh, the parameters when we got the design in our hand was the built up area was about 56,000 and odd square meter. Condition area was 57,000. We can eliminate the areas of staircase, etc., which is not uh, conditioned in other spaces. But most of the building you can say around 90, 90% 90 was air conditioned. The building was designed with a cooling load of 8,300 kilowatt, which is approximately 145 watt per square meter. The configuration of the building was G plus 23, where we have few common amenities uh, till six floor. Some to the typical office floor, uh, considering the uh, the uh, agreement, etc. We are not in a position to display the complete project details. Uh, we have taken the concurrence from the client before we display this to you but then we have shown we have taken some typical areas where we can show how exactly the value engineering or the optimization was done so that is typical floor and top four floors are of the residential suit the building was on a, a creek area so the area is considered what you can see on a high humid area uh, and it was a, a just 20 meter around the things. When we got the design, we looked into entire details and applied the codes and improvisation techniques, which were completely in line with ASHRAE standards and uh, DM guidelines and municipality guidelines. Uh, the first thing what we did after getting the the building was uh, we developed the complete load breakup. So the complete load breakup of the building was like this. We had a typical component. We have external loads and we have internal loads. For external loads, it's more of a wall and roof and window transmissions. And then we have internal loads as lighting, equipment, people, uh, so and so on. These parameters were broken into the each element and summary was done. If you look at the whole thing, 
the external loads apart from the pressure and infiltration are hardly 15 percent and the internal loads are to a level of about 60 to 65 percent and 20 percent contributes because of the pressure and uh, 10 percent because of the infiltration so 30 percent so when we do this analysis it gives an idea for the designer which area we have to focus for the optimization so looking at the table we evaluated anything which is around 10 percent should be our first target for the optimization of the office design so the parameters worked out were overhead lighting equipment people infiltration pressure load and kitchen load this was further uh, put into the, the chart of the or pie chart you can say which gives better understanding A pie chart, uh, a visual impression always is better than the numbers. So, if you look at the pie chart, 18 percent of the load comes because of the pressure load, 16 percent because of the electric equipment, uh, 14 percent is because of the people, 10 percent because of infiltration, 9 percent because of overhead lighting. So, if we encompass these parameters, we are talking about almost 60 percent of the load is getting covered. Apart from that, we also talk about U value or fenestration, which is improvisation that can be also looked into. So, these parameters we evaluated for each aspect. When we talk about these loads, they are always backed up by some reference standard and guidelines. So, when we talk about the ventilation or pressure requirement, it is ASHRAE 62.1. When we talk about energy efficiency, etc., it it is actually 90.1. So those parameters were considered. Applying that standard plus, there are inherent clauses. If we apply those clauses, the efficiency or the design gets further improvised. What happens in typical scenarios? Those fine clauses are not uh, evaluated or applied uh, because of the pressure of the time or the deliverables. And then it tends to little over design. This breakup was taken further. As I mentioned earlier, when we talk about pressure, it was 62.1, in the standards 90.1, and then there's a new standard for actually high performance screen building which is actually 189.1. Considering all these standards, we evaluated the optimization for the design for that. Right. A typical table, when we talk about actually, is all about this. It talks about the uh, airflow rate for the people, it talks about outdoor area, air, air rate, it talks about occupancy, and then the combination of that, a typical uh, zone wise distribution. So we talk, we apply this to the area, we get the occupancy, and then the number of people, we apply the flow rate, and we get the pressure requirement. Now, if we apply this as is, it goes to a very, very high level. One more thing which we want to highlight is in this table, there is for occupancy density, there is a node 4. That node 4 says that the density has to be applied when occupancy is unknown. Now, the building which we are uh, reviewing was a uh, corporate office for one of the uh, large scale entity where there all layouts of the office for me was frozen and was established. So we have taken the reference of that, but if you are talking about open office concepts, if you are talking about retails where the distribution of the furniture or merchandising is not known, then we are supposed to apply this occupant density. Why it's saying so? We are not compromised these aspects, we have also looked into it. But for fresh air and for people, the key part is occupancy. That's why we are looking at this aspect.
look at this scientific look at the typical aspect of this uh, uh, area where we have a space which is which is comprising of open office we have some conference room we have some cabins and the meeting room as well so if you go as for the furniture the, the occupancy was 39 and the inputs from client where we should design for the worst condition taking the inputs the things are completely further uh, divided so the occupancy was 39 when we started evaluating the areas and establishing the requirements we found occupancy was on a much higher side as compared to ashray so to the same depth we applied the ashray 6.1 standard it it says that the occupancy for the office areas shall be considered as five people per 100 square meter which talks 20 square meter per person the whole area of the office was in the range of about 360 square meter so applying that if we go with 20 square meter the occupancies are in the range of about 17 to 18 so the full time occupants are 17 if we apply that to the whole office you can say the rate blocks which talks about fte which are 17 to 18 it also has the areas where we have floating occupancies like we have the sitting areas we have meeting rooms we have office areas where the visitors are there and a small table for the visitors or the uh, guests now these are all floating occupancies ashray says when you have multiple floating occupancies in or rather ashray 611 to be very precise it says if you have multiple uh, occupancy zones which are floating we can consider the floating zone with maximum occupancy so which can be considered as a uh, as a meeting room which is having occupancy of six now these occupancies are for a short period of time so we need not give a pressure which is going to add a huge load to entire thing just imagine this is one part of the one floor similarly this is you can say probably one six of the office floor plate which you have taken and, uh, and crop the image we have six times the floor, floor plate for this area and 28 floors in typical so that combination if you exaggerate it goes multifold the impact will see as in tone approach so these six occupants can be considered as a floating occupancy as per ashes given one so the occupancy from 39 has come down to 23 by application of just one parameter that floating occupancy of maximum zone has been considered this is called diversity of occupancy which actually allows next going for that it also talks about the time zoning or uh, allowing the time averaging meter when we talk about time averaging the occupants which are there in the uh, in a floating area that time can get averaged by the amount of uh, time you spend like typical conference room typical conference room has a period of 45 minutes to 90 uh, 60 minutes as a as occupancy time we will not have the occupancy of six people at all the point of time then the equation which we apply through then we will get the floating occupancy for that zone as three if we have further details on that we'll discuss after the presentation where i can notify what clauses and how these floating occupants can be turned to three for the reference i'm just giving a standard it talks about equation in actual time section 6.2.6.2 so it's time averaging section 6.2 so initial occupancy was 39 when we applied actually this one one the occupancy turned out to be 24 and when we applied further time averaging method it was brought down to the level of 20. 
Now, summary of that has been compiled in a table. So, the red column notifies what was the original design. The second green zone talks about the ASHRAE standards and if you go at ASHRAE, what is the occupancy? And if you talk, if you apply the time averaging method as per ASHRAE 61, which is the fine clause, the occupancy for the considered area works out to be 20. Open office remains 15 as we are talking about 20 square meter per person. So it gives 15, 15. So concentrate on the first floor, open office, original was 20. It has been brought to 15 and 15 in both the cases. We discussed about meeting room three, which is a floating occupancy of six. So that's a floating occupancy. And office two and three, we had a one occupancy each. So if we add the ASHRAE occupants, it gives occupancy of 23 as per ASHRAE 61. Going further, if we apply time averaging method, the occupancy in the meeting room can be averaged to three. Hence, the occupancy will get reduced to 20. If you look at the whole aspect, the reduction is almost 50%. I have mentioned the clause. The actually oh, is 2.1 clause 6.2.5.3.1 allows the diversity. Based on that aspects, we have applied this diversity in the first aspect and time averaging, which is 6.2.6.2, will talk about the time averaging. These have direct impacts on the occupancy loads and the pressure. How is that? We'll take it further. So if you look at the oral occupancy comparison of the whole building, the original occupancy was designed with full provision details at almost 9,000 people. With application of actual parameters, it was brought down to 5,450. And further going down, it has been, it has been optimized to 4,600 people, which is almost 50% reduction in the occupancy. The design was reviewed and was acceptable to client and authorities as we move further. Once we do this occupancy, the other aspects which were evaluated for reduction of load or optimization of load was pressure requirement, which has direct connection with the occupancy, lighting, infiltration, optimizing the heat transfer coefficient of the facade. Again, actually 60.1 also talks about the transfer of air and class of air. That is how optimized. Then selection of equipment, how it can be optimized, selection of cooling towers and overall impacts. The first aspect was pressure. The formula which we all know, uh, the people and area, and D talks about the diversity factor, which talks about the complete system occupancy versus summation of zone occupancy. Normally, if you talk about office aspects, we can expect this diversity in the range of 30 to 40 percent as minimum. When we apply these aspects to the pressure requirement, the original pressure load for the building was in a range of 2000, uh, this is again a typical office floor plate which we are evaluated. Then we applied this floor plate as an extrapolation to the whole building. So whenever we discuss or whenever we are presenting the whole scenario, we are first of all establishing what was the case for one floor and how it was applied to the whole building. The pink column notifies the original design. The blue column notifies the uh, design parameters for as per ASHRAE and how taking the ASHRAE parameters, it can be further improvised has been mentioned in the orange uh, parameters or orange columns. So we have the, the liter per person and the liter per second per square meter parameters we have not changed uh, that, are, that are as per ASHRAE, but occupancies and time tuning has created the impact where 
we have reduced the fresher requirement from or it, it got reduced from 2000 liter per second to almost 1189 or 1190 liter per second as per hash rate and with further improvisation it, it came to a level of 1150 liter per second so almost you can say huge reduction we know in a building about 18 percent of the load is because of the fresh pressure which is 20 percent and if we break it down to almost 50 55 percent we are reducing load of a building almost by eight to nine percent this is without having any adverse impact on the whole performance of a building and without compromising the standards in ashray 60.1 there are three methods for ventilation or the to establish the outdoor one is the ventilation rate method where we are talking about these rates second is the uh, iaq method which is in indoor air quality method procedure and third is nat natural ventilation we all are talking about the simple first method of ventilation rate method if we apply iaq there are papers are published even there is a iaq uh, guidelines published by ashray it clearly establishes the requirement of pressure has been brought down to almost one third two third in the aspect which is talking about 33 percent but the standards and the application is tedious so most of the authorities accept and consider the ventilation method we have not deviated the whole exercise has been conducted considering ventilation rate method if we apply iaq it will further it can be further brought down applying those reduced uh, parameters to the whole building the pressure load was brought down from or has has come down from 1723 kilowatt to 1260 kilowatt so almost 23 percent reduction or 27 percent reduction has been obtained taking further we have also mentioned the bottom line our total load of the building was in the range of 8600 kilowatt by applying this methodologies and concepts of standards only for the pressure the overall load was has been brought down by almost 5.5 percent next parameter is lighting design now lighting is getting governed by ashray 90.1 there is a new standard or new publication in 2016 so it talks more of the energy and efficiency four major parameters get covered in ashray 90.1 are building envelope hvac system lighting and power systems and whole building energy performance so there are tables which are established how much lighting power density lpd we should consider for the office areas the original design which was was with 14 watt per square meter so for a given office typical floor plate it was almost 5.6 uh, kilowatt power of the lighting as we apply through lpd of 90.1 it gives the value of 9.14 so for the same area the lighting load works up to be almost 4.3 uh, kilowatt per floor which is again reduction by 25 percent ashray 189.1 which talks about the uh, green building practices or green practices if we apply that it allows it, it says that we should apply 95 percent of the of the uh, lpd of 90.1 we should target for that with new LED technologies, then we get the better lighting uh, densities as compared to the conventional one. So if we apply that, the load further gets down to level of 4 kilowatt instead of 5.6, which is a reduction of almost 30%. These are parameters. The further detailing can be done by actual working on the plants 
there are lighting levels available from lighting consultants we have details of fitting available so the exercise was carried out to establish what exactly are the parameters going in the project so a typical office floor was uh, taken for where we have lighting layouts their details the quantities the lux level established as well as the power consumptions when we established the whole mapping we realized that the lpd was in the range of almost 6 watt which is again probably 20% or 25% lower than what ashray recommends just imagine the building is with complete glass facade we have enough natural light 90.1 also talks about the controls with occupancy when people walk down with occupancy sensor the light will come on if the zones are bigger than 600 square feet uh, 600 square feet then we need to have the manual uh, lighting switches to avoid any wastage of the lighting so applying all these things the lighting board aesthetics will certainly come down as a design part and further we need to do energy modeling those aspects will further improve the energy consumptions so original was 5.6 application of the practical implementation of the lighting design on the hvc mapping established lighting load was 3.2 obviously there are other factors of utility and indexes which has been integral part of uh, heat load development and which have been taken into consideration one floor was further established to the whole building and reduction in lighting load was mapped into the whole aspects of the building so original load of lighting was 887 kilowatt which has brought to 675 and further reduction to 623 kilowatt which is almost 30% giving again impact on the overall design just by applying proper codes and evaluation the savings in the uh, whole design load was in the range of about 3 to 3.2%. So we discussed occupancy, we discussed fresh air, we discussed lighting. The next parameter we have considered was infiltration. Now, when we talk about infiltration, as we know, it goes on two parameters. One is the external pressures and internal pressures. Second. the stack effect which changes during winter season and summer seasons but predominantly the infiltration is applied to the facade of a building by and large application goes to a level where the infiltration is applied based on air changes so we have huge floor plates and we apply the air changes to level of say 0.1 0.2 or 0.3 so in this particular case considering on a safer side the 0.3 air changes was the uh, infiltration rate applicable applied just because we have huge exposure of the uh, humid uh, uh, humid facade uh, being the glass facade building infiltration rates could be on a higher side so the rates of 0.3 are just applied when we go through details and analyze the impact the total volume and infiltration rate of 0.3 changes for the particular floor resulted in a range of 532 liter per second of the infiltrated air now when we talk about infiltration air it's a direct air pressure we are having heat recovery and energy recovery systems infiltration is a direct load in the space so the load for the given floor was almost 30 kW we studied the whole facade and after study it was realized that instead of going with air changes if we go and apply 90.1 which talks about for a average 
tightness envelope not very tight or not loose average envelope tightness the infiltration rate can be considered as 0.3 liter per second per square meter of the facade now which is more practical when we talk about infiltration uh, the, the more appropriate thing is to talk about facade so we established the perimeter of the uh, of the floor plate and the height which is almost 3.7 or 3.6 meter for a typical floor with that we got the envelope area of 900 square meter and applying 0.3 got the infiltration rate details to almost 300 liter per second which is almost reduction of 50 percent so the infiltration load got, got reduced from 30 to 15 kilowatt again applying same principle when we take it further from the floor to the complete building the numbers were really encouraging the red side or red column notifies original design the last column notifies the optimized or improvised design the infiltration load for the whole building was almost in range of about 250 to 260 ton which is 1000 kilowatt has been established to a level of 440 kilowatt while saying while conducting these exercises at no point of time the standards have been compromised or the guidelines have been compromised one next component which we have established was about the heat transfer coefficient now the municipality or the authorities have stipulated guidelines which are very good considering the whole impact they have been applying a better u value or better heat transfer coefficients to be considered for the facade of the building considering the exposure considering the size so based on the uh, climate zone for dubai or for uae we talk about zero b which is very hot and humid uh, conditions the parameters are standardized to a level of uh, optimization still as a uh, overall impact of life cost analysis we established the two 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 aspects of a u value how it has impact on the uh, initial cost and how it can get compensated during operation cost so original glass value was 1.9 after improvised design the consideration was to 1.3 watt the external load is hardly 10 percent and then out of that the window load is i believe four to five percent applying to a typical floor we got the reduction in the load by almost 2.9 uh, kilowatt if we apply the percentage it goes to almost say 15 percent of the reduction in the load because of the only gas glass uh, facade or the glass uh, details mapping it further on the whole building the original component the first slide which we have established there was breakup in that the total exposure due to window was 468 kilowatt the parameters had improvised to 120 kilowatt which is probably a reduction in load by almost one percent going back again about distribution of air actually 62.1 we have the zones which talks about class of air class one air is the typical office air and then we have class two which is the little contaminated third is from the toilet class three and class four is the offensive air uh, 
This is a typical office flow in which we had a pressure distribution. We have the extract from the toilet and the other areas. And considering the uh, large uh, toilet spaces, the original design had distributed the supplier or the cold air from the fan call units in the uh, toilet areas, male and female toilet areas. However, being contaminated air, the air was extracted out from the toilet. There was no return, which is very correct. So, in the male toilet, supply air was 120 liter per second, as you can see on the drawing, and in female toilet, it was 70 liter per second. And the extracts to the level were at 150 and 100 respectively. By doing this, the whole toilet area was under negative pressure. Applying 62.1, where we talk about class of air. See, class one air is with very low contamination. Class two is with moderate contamination. Class one air can get transferred or recirculated in all other class of air. Class areas. Class two air can be recirculated in class two and it can transfer in class three and class four areas. But other way is not acceptable to the standard. Class three is like typical we are talking about toilet extract, which is not supposed to be recirculated. And uh, class four is potential hazard, particularly say laboratory or industrial exhausts are class four. So Ashray 61 allows transfer of class 1 air to class 2 and class 3 areas. Toilet being class 3 area, it is allowed by standard to transfer air from the office areas to toilet by means of by means of either infiltration or by means of any fans or even by means of the negative pressure which is created between two zones. When we applied this to the toilet areas, the fresh air or the supply air from the from the pantalets was removed uh, was removed from the uh, toilet areas, and it was compensated only by transfer of air. So class one air was transferred, which was conditioning the corridor spaces and office areas which was on a little positive pressure as compared to toilet areas. So with pressure differentials, the air was transferred uh, to the toilet. And that 120 liter per second, which was being fed from the fan ball unit was eliminated. Now, in a pressure balance, when we deliver 120 liter per second from fan ball unit, to the toilet areas and we extract it out at a fine point level we are supposed to compensate that air by the fresh air otherwise the building will go into the the negative zone so the typical toilet areas will be under negative pressure but the envelope of the whole floor or the building has to be under positive pressure to avoid infiltration so as we apply this code we can eliminate the requirement of dumping the supply air to the space and we can use the transfer air. If the toilets are bigger, we can use this transfer air by means of fan because the distribution of air or the efficiency of uh, distribution may not be adequate if the toilets are big. In that case, we can take this transfer air, use the fan and transfer that air from class one area to class three and extract it out instead of giving a typical cold air. Even actually doesn't talk about comfort conditions in this area because occupancy is temporary occupancy. So it's just a relief cooling where temperatures can be maintained to a level of 26, 27 degrees centigrade without any issue. So those sort of little application of the standard in detail can save a good amount of cooling load in the, as well as the energy. So, 
applying this got reduction per floor by 3.5 kilowatt which is one ton the two toilets so overall impact on the whole building was a reduction in load by 77 kilowatts various parameters when we started mapping against each other for the first slide the parameters which we did not touch written as it is and application of ashray parameters and improvised design has been mapped with blue and orange color focusing on uh, these parameters lighting got reduced from 887 to 623 Electric equipment got reduced to 1451 from 1612. People got reduced. Infiltration came to almost half. Pressure load got reduced. Other areas like kitchen load, losses, supply of fan, safety factors, we did not touch. The safety factors can also get improvised. This total load, we the constant diversity of 85% for selection of equipment was applied. So total load from almost 9,800 kilowatt, as we applied our fee to the original design, it was 8,326 kilowatt. While the application of standards and detailed application of the parameters established the total load itself as 7,500 kilowatt which is much lower than the demand load established in the initial design. Diversity remains same because we have different occupancies, we have different uh, facades available. The total load is summation of all zones and when we establish the system sizing, that diversity can be, can be applied which is completely in line with again ASHRAE standards and 85% diversity is acceptable for the office building. So the load gets reduced from 8,200 as a demand load to 6,300. The percentage reductions map pressure as the overall impact gets reduced by 5.6% infiltration by 6.7 percent these two parameters itself gets reduction in load by about 12 percent lighting 3.2 again just applying the lpds as per ashray and using the correct uh, design which has been established by the lighting specialists which is allowed by 90.1 ashray says that if you have the modeling established you can use those parameters for the designing uh, people that is the first thing which we established uh, how the application of time average and occupancy diversity can get uh, reduced loads because in all the spaces 22 floors all spaces with the uh, floating occupancy the, the level of occupants were very very high so applying that the reduction in load established was seven percent external u value facade improvisation got reduction in load of 1.5 percent and other areas get got reduction to 3.3 percent so the overall calculation or calculated load reduction was 27 percent when we applied diversity the realized reduction in pulling load was in the range of 23 percent on thumb rule parameters uh, it was or i'll not say thumb rule it's a density parameter uh, 145 watt per square meter was the original design and the improvised design was established at almost 111 watt per square meter this as part of ashray 90.1 we talk about the EER established as per various guidelines. We are talking about pressure 
has to be with VMD uh, motor because for the diversification or diversified occupancies, we go with demand control variation ventilation. For demand control ventilation, we need to have the varying speed of the uh, varying quantity of the fresh air. When we take these aspects, the starting current of the FHU has to get improvised. The power consumption has to get under control. So FHU are with BMD, which are recommended by again, actually 189.1. CO2 sensors in the areas where we have densities to level of 2500 square, uh, square meter. We are having heat recovery wheel, which is mandated by the authorities over here considering the high impact on the energy consumption because of pressure, occupancy sensors, and unoccupied mode ventilation to fresh air. Again, talking about last point, if the building is in unoccupied mode, the parameter of people can be brought to zero. That's what actually 62.1 notifies. We cannot compromise the parameter of space, but the typical office buildings have had density, high occupancy in the day hours, say from 8 o'clock in the morning to say 7 o'clock in the evening. After that, the occupancy level drops down to almost zero in most of the spaces. In such times, the pressure pertaining to occupancy can be absolutely brought to zero. There are further oh, techniques available where we are talking about night cooling, where we can push the uh, fresh air at low uh, ambient temperature and low enthalpy uh, at night times, and night cooling can be achieved. It can be handled in winter time. The only aspect we need to establish or take consideration is the humidity. We should not allow humidity to go beyond. 55 to 60 percent. Even the current uh, notification from ASHRAE about COVID also says the humidity or RH should be in the range of about 40 to 60 percent. While all our comfort air conditioning applications, we generally talk about 50 to 60 percent. So it completely falls in place. So humidity, when we push the external air to reduce the energy consumption, becomes a challenge. So night cooling and pushing the pressure at low ambient conditions can further improvise the, the efficiency of a system. That selection of equipment, how it can be done and how it can be improvised are in the next slides. So the original design with diversity, we established the space load to the range of 8326 kilowatt. The breakup of the load was space load was uh, 8000 kilowatt and uh, pressure load was about 1700 kilowatt. Now, when we talk pressure selection, we talk at two parameters. We, we, we talk about 4629, which is high ambient or high sensible. Second, we talk about high humidity, which is 3432. All authorities, even municipality, ask for selection of FHU at 3432. So predominantly, the designer takes both the extremes and adds to the load, and then the is applied. But both these peaks do not happen simultaneously. When we have a high sensible, we don't have high humidity. So the two parameters are non-concurrent. Just mapping these parameters with the respective peaks, we can see what difference is. The demand load at this point of time, we can see is 8,300. When we apply to each parameter, the mapping has been established for pressure AHU and space load at 4629. So at 4629, the pressure load is little lower. You can see table one and table two only FHU. FHU load is almost 170 kilowatt more at high humid condition because of high enthalpy. While space load is almost 100, 
50 or 60 kilowatt more at high sensible condition without doing anything if we just apply these two parameters separately we can establish about 200 kilowatt reduction in the base design itself as these two concurrent peaks don't occur together for designing of the chiller system or cooling towers we can consider at 4629 while equipment sizing a particular FH2 sizing has to be done at 1723 that is the original design when we map the improvised design parameters the loads of pressure to got reduced from 1500 to 1126 at 4629 and 1260 at 3432 so fresh air selection has to be at 1260 while it's complete system sizing when we are talking about chiller in the cooling tower the peak of the whole load is 17417 hence the corresponding peak of it, the corresponding FH load has to be considered at the peak so by doing this without doing any uh, any uh, little engineering as such by we can apply the parameters where we can reduce the load almost by about 200 kilowatt in the original design and almost 600 kilowatt in the improvised design the thing which goes for uh, chillers same thing goes for a cooling tower we discussed that the conditions are considered as 34 32 which is 32 is a winter temperature and for sizing a cooling tower we take approach of 3 degrees centigrade so normally approach is 3 degrees and range is 5 degrees so the cooling tower in our temperatures are established in a range of about 35 to 40 degrees in and out but the peaks have got deferred for the chiller so the capacities will differ accordingly at 34 32 we do not have the peak of the ac the peak of the ac requirement is at 46 29 so we need not select the cooling tower at 34 32 for the load of 46 29 that can be analyzed what is the peak load at 34 32 what is the peak load of 46 29 and we can apply the same approach. So, if we are selecting the cooling tower at 4629, we can apply the in and out temperature for cooling tower as instead of 3 degrees, we can have approach of 4 degrees to, to be on the safer side. And we can select 37, 33, 37 or 37, 33, 38 as a condenser water in and out temperature or a cooling water in and out temperature. As we are selecting cooling towers for a high humid conditions 34 32 but at that time the peak load is not uh, the uh, the optimized uh, to the level of 46 29 so as we are selecting cooling tower for 34 32 the load can be at 7540 which is almost uh, 70 kilowatt lower than the peak of that this further optimizes chiller selection Cooling tower selection, pumps, everything gets down to a level and can, the design gets optimized. Everything at the end of the day boils down to the energy consumption. So the energy consumption of these parameters were further mapped on the table. These are the, these are the uh, Parameters the original load 8400 diversified against 6300 applying the ER of uh, 90.1, the cooling load powers for the chiller, individual chiller were 580, you know, improvised it turned out to 433. Same is the cooling tower, chill water pumps, secondary chill water pumps, cooling tower pumps fan power got reduced 
So the oral equipment only for the AC. Here we are not talking about lighting. This, this is predominantly exercise only for the AC equipment. But reduced from 2700 kilowatt to 1600 kilowatt. So almost 1050 kilowatt reduction in AC power consumption. We know Deva has guidelines for loading of transformer. So 1000 kilowatt, if we have the motors more, more than 100 kilowatt, we can load up to 950 kilowatt. If it's 1500 kVA or 650 kilowatt, if it's 1000 kVA. So the reduction in transformers were established from 13 to 11. Obviously, when we are doing all this optimization, there is a huge reduction in initial cost. Similarly, there is a reduction in operational maintenance cost. The more this equipment, the more the capacities, so more the maintenance. So looking at the complete life cycle, the initial cost is lower, operational cost is lower, maintenance cost is lower. Further, what happens predominantly is in today's scenario, energy audits are coming into picture. If we establish the base models very strong, then there is no need of applying the addition forces. We what the typical complaints which we get from client is even in peak summer, the chillers are not full operational. Out of four chillers, in peak summer, two are operational. This probably happens because this inherent uh, parameters which go into design. Client tend to be on safer side and uh, they suggest to design on safe side, which goes on the old design. When it comes to the performance level and it is over design, the efficiencies are lower and it gives a window for the energy audit. And energy audit, what it starts, it starts taking the readings of the uh, chiller consumption motor consumption, pump consumption, and then mapped against the universal guidelines as per the climatic condition and establish the parameters on a yearly basis, which actually 211 notifies other energy audit parameters. But if we go and start looking at the basic parameters, there's a huge scope at the design itself where things can be brought to a level to optimization. All the standards do talk and give the freedom to the designers that they should apply themselves without compromising the, the, the code compliances. So a designer has to play a key role in analyzing and applying those codes in the appropriate fashion. In conclusion, even if you apply the standards, there is always scope for improvement. The Let us analyze the complete building as a whole entity instead of applying parameters in parts, saying go with, go with full occupancy, safer design. Energy audit is not only about using these sophisticated controls. Yes, we need to, if you have to control, we have to measure. If you have to measure, we have, we have to monitor. So everything goes in hand in hand. But even for energy audit in the existing building, we can always there is the element to go and check back the, the design components and there can be a possibility to optimize that. Sustainability is not by only giving the latest technology and controls, but it is evaluating the buildings based on the fundamental concepts. So to just case study uh, which, which, which was conducted and gave us a Results which are really encouraging at the same time alarming. Detail engineering at practices will always lead to a little extra time but better sizing and reduction in the pricing. In today's construction industry, cost effectiveness, cost efficiency is a key aspect. So instead of compromising on the specification, if the buildings are designed to better levels that can be achieved in much better way. Today, value engineering has come as a moon or disguise, whatever we can say, 
in the industry and any data which is floated comes up with value engineering parameters. But if the designs are handled to the optimization, probably that requirement will get a little bit reduced. Again, one more aspect which whole industry is talking about instead of going with um, code and compliance method, try to design the methodology or the buildings with performance or specifications. With that, the designer will become more vigilant, get a freedom, and apply the better designs, which will be beneficial to the whole industry and all stakeholders. With that, I take a break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sagar, for the presentation. Yeah. Aina, Thank I will you. now be opening the floor for our attendees in case they would like to ask questions. Um, we have not received any written questions. So uh, since your topic is pretty technical, um, I would like anyone who has a question, if they can unmute themselves, introduce themselves where they work and ask you the question. Does anyone have a question they would like to ask? Okay. Okay, Mr. Abad, I have unmuted you if you would like to ask a question. Thank you. Uh, Abad Al Amari from Khatib and Alami, uh, consultant. Yeah. Uh, I have one question regarding the fresh air. Yeah. Yeah, when, we, when you apply the, divers, uh, the diversity for uh, the people and fresh air, yeah. uh, how we can apply this if we don't have uh, uh, demand control ventilation? You know, when we design uh, for uh, uh, meeting room and uh, other rooms, uh, we have to supply the required fresh air. But if we don't have a demand control ventilation for each and every room, how we can apply this diversity? And uh, is it accepted by uh, uh, Dubai municipality or uh, the code if we apply to USGBC? Uh, demand control ventilation yeah, as per standards, yes, it is required. Uh, but it talks also the density. If you are having density of 25 people per thousand hundred square meter, then only they talk about demand control ventilation. If your area is smaller, then we do not give a demand control ventilation to each and every room. If you talk a small meeting room of say uh, 20 square meter, it will it doesn't need that. When you talk about demand control ventilation, ventilation. 62.1 clearly stipulates the area as well as occupancy. Taking further your question, uh, the, the diverse needs uh, section, as I mentioned, 6.2.3.5 clearly notifies that we need not apply complete pressure requirement for each zone because people are moving. People in the office, they'll be at place, they'll be in the cafeteria, they'll be in the meeting room. So it's the same person who is moving at various places. So designing for the worst condition does not mean that for that person has to get counted at four different locations. So that diversity is a, can be applied and it can be brought down. Yeah, but uh, this, we can apply it for the complete uh zone or the the complete floor but uh, yeah. if we don't have a demand control ventilation uh, we cannot make sure that the required fresh air for each zone will be delivered uh, during uh, a meeting or during something 
Okay. So, Particularly, our areas of concern are meeting rooms and the conference rooms. Okay. Yeah. So, for this, we should not go and apply the occupancy diversity. There is a second clause in 6211, which is uh, section 6.2.6, which is time averaging method. Time averaging method, we, we know the liter per second and we know uh, per square meter and per person uh, pressure requirement as per ash rate. That cannot be compromised. But when we talk about that uh, equation, uh, there's the equation called uh, time averaging, where based on the volume and pressure of how much you are giving pressure, it talks how many minutes that can withstand. So you can apply that. That time averaging method gets you the uh, pressure requirement to almost 50%. So apply time averaging to conference room and meeting rooms, not the occupancy diversity. That is acceptable to authorities as well as the code. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saga. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? You can raise your hand and I can unmute you from my side. Okay, it seems that we do not have any more questions. Before we close, uh, as per usual, we will be sending out an email containing this presentation to all people who have attended, and we, it will also be uploaded on our newly launched website. If you haven't taken a look at it, please do. And also, I would like to inform everyone that we have launched our yearly Mina Green Building Awards. Please take a look at our new website and see if there are any categories that you would like to apply to. We welcome all of your applications and we wish you the best of luck. Uh, we will also be providing the recording of this presentation uh, online on our YouTube channel if you would like to view it. Thank you very much for your, for your attending. Thank you very much, Mr. Sagar, for your presentation. And I hope that we will uh, have you on one of our coming webinars. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you. Thank you.